Welcome to the Perfectly Integrated Podcast, hosted by Matt Ackerman, where we show the power of teamwork in wealth management. Now, on to the show. How and why we communicate on a daily basis really sets a tone. Is our communication transactional? Is it genuine? What do our words say about us? As someone who spent his life really trying to communicate as intelligently and as succinctly as possible, I'm fascinated by the concept of communication. I mean, I majored in communications at Seton Hall way back in, in the 90s. You know, we won't have to give it a date just now, but anyway, it was a while ago. And sometimes still my methods still feel about as garbled as a Pearl Jam song. See what I did there? 1990s reference. Anyway, well, today I'm excited to talk about communication and trust with someone who literally wrote the report on it with the FPA, Carol Anderson, who is president of MQ Research and Education, and my good friend, Andre Peterson from Integrated Partners, who helps our advisors communicate with clients every day. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So, Carol, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to really start broadly. How essential is trust when it comes to an advisor working with clients? Well, I absolutely think it's essential. It's really the bedrock of the relationship. It's it's the foundation for establishing any long-term relationship for sure. Gives it the stickiness, um, consistency that I think any advisor really wants in developing their, their practice. Andre, how important is communication in establishing and maintaining that kind of trust? I mean, I completely agree with Carol. I wrote, it's vital. Um, Building trust takes time, but it's imperative that advisors do what they say they're going to do. That's a big theme we always say. Just do what you say you're going to do and have continuous communication with your clients during good times and bad times. I mean, right now, you know, given what's going on in the world is a really important time for advisors to be proactively communicating with their clients. And it's important to be transparent when discussing good situations and addressing bad situations with clients. We try to say every interaction with a client is an opportunity to build a raving fan and create an experience. So advisors and their teams should really capitalize on those opportunities. Carol, creating that experience is so interesting and so much has evolved over the last two years. You know, when you think about the mode of communication these days. Is it important, you know, as we compare like, you know, Zoom, multimedia, email, video versus kind of that traditional phone snail mail sitting across a desk? Well, I think the pandemic has really forced a shift for sure in how we communicate. And I think luckily before the pandemic, there were a number of people that were already adopting this form of communication. So for some, the transition was fairly easy. And I think for those that had not made the shift in terms of communicating with their clients using Zoom, they were surprised at how how well they could continue to work with their clients and how well the experience worked. So I think you need to keep in mind some of the same elements of face-to-face communication in terms of positioning your camera so that it there's the uh, eye contact, that you can see um, body language, um, you can you know really have get a picture of what's going on in the client's lives at that time so much you can read into their their expressions on their face. So I feel that uh, a Zoom connection is far greater than having phone connection or email. Um, it it's definitely provides a lot of value, particularly in times when you cannot get together. I mean, I couldn't agree more. It's And we've all done it, right? We all can get on a phone call and get distracted by something else. Or, you know, we start to wander. But in a Zoom, when we can actually see the people and, you know, see how engaged they are and really get into it, it, it changes communication completely. Yeah, Andrea, what, what do you think? What, what do clients expect from their advisor when it comes to communication? I think they expect for the advisor to meet them where they're at. So some clients, while Zoom is a great medium for them, some people like handouts. So if you know your client likes a handout, but you're conducting a Zoom meeting, make sure you send them the PDFs in advance or have your team mail it to their houses. But leveraging communication methods in a way that works for the clients is 
really important for the advisor to understand. So, you know, we would recommend when you're talking to your client, get an understanding of, are they okay with the Zoom meeting, what that structure looks like, or, you know, would they prefer you confirm your Zoom meeting over phone versus email and keep those notes in your CRM so you understand how to properly communicate with the clients. And then what Carol said about your Zoom setup is also really important because as you create that experience for the client, you know, we're always checking out. Matt's got a very cool background and (laughs) makes me think he's like a radio host, Ryan Seacrest over there. But it's important to portray, you know, that what your look and the experience of your office through your Zoom meeting as well. So it's your surrounding is definitely important. I think along with that, too, is making sure that um, the client is comfortable with whatever type of technology that you'd be using for the virtual communication. So if it requires like a a test run ahead of time, um, maybe the planner or an assistant can go through the process with them, make sure that they understand it. Because if they're going into the experience tense and like they don't know if they're going to be able to manage it well, then, you know, they're not going to be present for the meeting. You know, that's a really good word there, present. And I know sometimes we were just saying, you know, when you're on a phone call, you can get distracted easily. It can happen just as easily with Zoom calls. You know, we all have fallen victim to, well, they're, I, I'm not the speaker here at this portion of the Zoom, so I'm going to go look at an email or, you know, something. So I, I've said to advisors of ours, you know, have a file folder handy and put it over that side of the screen or turn off all other applications and get disciplined about that because, you know, being present in that conversation is everything. You know, if you you don't want to have to sit there and go, wait, what did you just say? Because then everyone knows that you were distracted, even though your eyes were fixed on that camera, really they were checking out an email or Twitter or any other application that happened to be open at that moment. You know, to, to me, I, I was really enthralled, Carol, by the great research that you did. I thought it was really incredible on both communication and trust. You know, talk to us a little about what you discovered. Well, this was uh, actually a replication of a study from 15 years ago that showed very positive correlations between communication and trust. And um, actually, that had been established uh, even before our study way back in the 1990s. There were some great studies um, showing that in financial planning relationships, that communication was the most powerful predictor of long-term and successful client communication. But what we wanted to do was to break that down a bit, you know, to communication has a very broad definition and we wanted to uh, take a look at specific elements of communication and also wanted to uh, test the viability of a more holistic delivery model, the one that we call life planning, which focuses very much on understanding clients' values and priorities, and then uh, defining the whole, designing the whole experience so that it really focuses on what's most important to the client. So the 2006 study definitely showed very high correlations between trust and commitment and those elements of communication. But that was before the, uh, so many other stressors have come into our lives, the financial crises, um, the pandemic, and so on and so forth. So we wanted to see, did these findings still hold? And, it, and they did. In fact, in some regards, the correlations were even stronger than before. Um, And other research has shown us that during times of um, stress uh, and confusion, that individuals go back to the basics, you know, really considering what's most important to them. So a delivery model that really focuses on making that kind of connection with their clients is, is very successful. It's so interesting because as you think about all the new stressors that have come out in these last 15 years, but there is this interest in going back to basics. Mm -hmm. Uh, Andre, do you think that 
when we have those kind of stressors, it impacts trust. It impacts who we trust. It impacts, you know, how we communicate, you know, what, how does the, all, all that's evolved over the last 15 years, how has it changed kind of that mindset? I mean, it definitely does. There's so many external influences that everybody receives every day, you know, significantly more than in 2006. You're on Twitter, you're reading the news, you're talking to your friends, you're more connected than you've ever been in your ent- in, you know, history, right? And to say that, you know, your friends being concerned about their financial situation doesn't affect you would be wrong, you know? And so it's important to go back to those basics, remind clients, we have a plan, we've prepared for this. You know, these are the things that we're doing because those outside influences might make them feel not okay. So checking in with them to making sure they are okay is really important. And, you know, another key thing Carol talked about was life planning, you know, focusing on clients' goals and objectives and you know, not necessarily just investments every time you have a conversation with them. So bringing the plan back to their individual situation to ensure they understand will help in these scenarios as well. And Carol, you mentioned this is research that, you know, comes, uh, you know, as a follow-up to this research you guys did 15 years ago, and but so much has changed in that time. How, how has that shift and how, how has it kind of in this evolution of communication, how has that shift impacted advisors and how they communicate with clients too? Well, we did notice that the data showed that advisors have um, a lot more confidence in their communication, in the way they communicate, uh, in the effectiveness of it, than how the the clients evaluated that effectiveness. So there seems to be a disconnect. So there's a you know a few examples of that in terms of recommend providing recommendation in terms that clients can understand. So the planners uh, rated themselves much higher than the clients did, for example, or providing recommendations that are are based on the client's um, values and priorities in life. And again, the rated their effectiveness much higher than the clients did. So there's a bit of a disconnect. And it might very well be that the planner's intention is to do that. And they feel that they are, but somehow it's not being communicated to their clients. So sort of reevaluating, sometimes incorporating a process that is very clearly shown, demonstrates to the client that they are uh, exploring their values and priorities, that they are intentionally linking their financial goals uh, and the strategies that they recommend to those values and goals. That that process will demonstrate to the, the client what they are doing, and it will come across much more clearly. Andrea, it's such an interesting point because advisors have this amazing confidence. It's, what's, it's what really makes them so good at what they do. But you know, are most advisors as good at communicating as they think they are? I think that you know when you're so well versed on a topic and you're communicating about it, you understand it, so you believe other people understand it as well. But sometimes they don't understand it. You know, and a great example, Matt might talk to me about recording a podcast and how that works. And he does it all day, every day. So he tells me the process, it makes sense to him. But to me, I can't always connect those dots. So when he goes back to and seeks to understand my understanding of the process, then he can recognize where the gaps are. So it's really good when advisors are asking questions and connecting with their clients through that process versus just the explanation point. You know, we always recommend to advisors, you shouldn't be talking the entire meeting. You've got some key concepts you want to get across and you got to make sure you do that. But you've also got to give the client the opportunity to speak, ask questions, dive deeper into, you know, what they're saying so you can better understand how they're comprehending those topics or, you know, where they might have a gap or a trust issue 
what with what you're explaining. Visuals also are great. So there's so much wonderful fintech out there that helps connect here's your plan and here's how this is going to help you get to your goal of buying a house in 10 years or, you know, funding your grandkids college, whatever the case may be, but there's great pieces that you can leverage during that financial planning process to help clients understand how you're connecting their goals and helping them work towards their goals. My Mom was a big fan of saying, you have to be a good listener. Usually she meant, I'm one of eight kids. So she usually, she was just trying to get us to call quiet down. But, but Carol, it's so interesting to me because listening is so essential for financial advisors, but, you know, sometimes, and we're all, we're all, we all, we all are at fault for this. Sometimes we all can sometimes, you know, be waiting for just a chance to talk and not really listening. Uh, what is something advisors can do, you know, as you've looked at this so that they can do that part of communication better so they can listen to their clients better rather than just waiting to talk? I think it really um, boils down to intention. And oftentimes, if a a planner advisor just takes a few minutes before a client meeting to really center themselves, it may sound very woo-woo, but it really does get them in that space where they're ready to really tune in to the client, the, the individual that's in front of them, and to view them as an individual that has unique expectations, unique set of circumstances, um, unique set of challenges, and really, you know, apply their curiosity to really getting to know and understand the individual ahead of them. So that is, I think, the key. And in terms of, I think that's the the main part of being a good communicator, for sure. So just set with intention. A lot of advisors tend to want to avoid the more personal conversations around an individual's life because they don't feel like they're equipped to answer all the questions that they might have or all the situations that they might be in. But it's really about showing that you care and that you're interested and also really helping them to see the link between the financial advice that they provide and um, the the individual's life and what's highest priority in their minds at the time. I think it's also important to, to realize that priorities change over time. And so just to keep in touch and to continue to explore with the client what is foremost on their minds at the time. And, uh, you know, maybe that goal has changed. And if the financial advisor keeps working towards one goal, that might not be what the, is important to the client anymore. I love that idea of setting an intention. You know, we talk to advisors about making sure you have a really strong agenda and a process for that meeting. And ideally you're sending that to the client in advance to your point, Carol. So you can say, this is what we're planning on talk about. Do you have anything you also want to add? Checking in on their life, what's going on in their lives to make sure if anything's changed, that's being incorporated into the ongoing plan. But especially on Zoom, a client meeting is kind of like a performance. So you've got to get yourself amped up and ready to bring the energy. Um, I call it the zazzle when you're in a meeting because you want the client to walk out of that meeting and say, that was a really great experience. You know, people tell others about experiences. So you're looking to build your, you know, business through referrals, providing that experience and, you know, leveraging different mediums when you're on Zoom. If you're used to drawing, you know, Get a technology that can help you draw on Zoom. Make sure you're showing pieces and then, you know, stopping the screen share so you can check in and really see the client and engage with them. But it it really is kind of a performance. Oh, it's absolutely a performance. It's always performance. I mean, and and I always say to myself between Zoom calls in a day, because you when all of us have had, had days where we have five to six, seven different Zoom calls, I say, hey. Though this is number four for me, it's their first with this. So I've got to amp it up. So there's times between calls and stuff. I'll be very honest. I put music on in this room. I'm singing or moving around. It's so easy to kind of get the dead eye stare that you have to remember that 
you are performing every time you're in a meeting, every time, whether it's Zoom or face to face. And, you know, you got to bring that same excitement to every conversation you have. So with all those thoughts about Zoom, Carol, what do you think is, will this kind of virtual communication, this new formats that we've gotten comfortable with over the last years, are they going to persist beyond the pandemic? I I really think they will. In fact, a number of financial advisors are already making the shift completely to working with their clients virtually, and they're having quite good success with it. I do think the pandemic forced the shift for for many individuals. And so it it forced them to get comfortable with the technology. It also provided the opportunity for them to see the benefits. Um, It's better for our environment. You know, we're not out there uh, using up as much fuel on the planes and cars and so forth. There's just, there's a lot of benefits and that we can leverage. You know, in the bigger metropolitan areas, just the time it takes to drive to their planner's office or vice versa for the planner to drive to their client's home, it's, you know, it it's a big time suck for sure. So I think it's here to stay and it's going to grow. Um, the other thing is that it forced people to get comfortable with that technology if they'd been avoiding it. So, and luckily before the pandemic, a lot of even, you know, older individuals had gotten very comfortable with using Zoom because of wanting to keep in touch with their family uh, during this time. So it's definitely here to stay for sure. So I think we just need to figure out the very best ways to leverage the experience and helping clients prepare as well for a good experience, making sure that their technology is up to speed, that they understand how to navigate it. You know, some trial trial runs with them can be very helpful in helping them to be very tuned in to the meeting when that time comes. Andre, this is such a relationship business. Can, you think advisors can continue to develop such deep and lasting relationships, even as they continue this uh, shift to uh, more virtual communication? Absolutely. Because to Carol's point, <clears throat> everybody is using it in all aspects of their lives now. So it's not an uncommon method of communication. And I think Carol's point about travel is so important. We always talk to our advisors about protecting their time. So by not rushing from meeting to meeting, you can be more present in your meetings because you're not worried about, I got to get out of here. What if there's traffic to get to my next meeting? You know, I'm in my house or I'm at my office. It's a much more like calm process. So when advisors can be present and really connect with their clients, then they, you know, are still building that same relationship. I'd argue that in a way, because they have more time, they can build stronger relationships because they can spend a little bit more time with each client connecting with them. Um, And then, you know, they've got to work it into their service model. So there may be some clients that say, hey, I really want to come see you or meet you in person for this specific meeting. I've got a big life change or we've got a lot to talk about. And, and you've got to be a little bit flexible with that as well. But for the everyday running of your practice, as long as you're setting those client expectations about what your process and your working relationship looks like, people can thrive in the Zoom world. This has been such an amazing conversation. So Carol, just to help us kind of look ahead a little bit here, you know, what's ahead? How do we continue to get better from here? Uh, what's, what's, what's next? What's ahead? In terms of communication with their clients, I assume. Well, I do think it's important to continue to learn and grow in this area. So seeking out sessions at conferences that really focus on client communication, reading books, uh, listening to podcasts, all those things help you to maintain that mindset that allows you to be aware and present for the client and to um, be in tune with what's most important to them. So oftentimes I find that advisors want to avoid some of the important life questions because they're not feeling comfortable with addressing those. But once they um, 
become more confident and brave enough to give it a try, that's when they begin to really uh, enjoy that deeper connection with the clients, get that real intrinsic reward of having deeper and more satisfying client relationships as well. So it's, it's really worth kind of pushing their comfort zones a bit and exploring this area of deeper exploration with their clients. Andre, what do you think? Uh, what's ahead? What's your big takeaway? Yeah, I mean, focusing on the changes that continue to come. I mean, there's so much technology out there to help advisors better communicate with clients, but making sure you find the technology that's right for you and your practice and not trying to right fit your process into a technology, but truly finding a technology that mirrors your process and enhances your process. And remembering that this business is about relationships. So those deeper life questions are important. I mean, we're in a world that communicates more about emotions and things. So tapping into that to find those connection points with your clients is going to be important and going forward. This has been such a, a wonderful conversation. Thank you both so much. My last question is always for my 10-year-old son, CJ. He helps me put a lot of this stuff into perspective. You know, we sat down and we were talking about this uh, after school and um, we talked about communication. We talked about trust and he agreed it was kind of weird to talk about talking since we were already talking. But anyway, he asked, I prefer to communicate with people through text messages rather than call- phone calls. And I hate it when my dad writes me a note and leaves it in my bag or in my lunch. But I really hate it when he doesn't answer my text quick. Quickly. Do you think we can ever just get older people like my dad? Great. I'm older now uh, to just send me a text. It's so much faster. Carol, what do you think? Are, are, is, do you think, because my perspective is he doesn't talk enough. It's always through the phone, but what do you think? Are, do you think kind of this next generation is kind of so in tune with technology that, that they don't want to have a nice conversation sometimes? Well, I think it's, that's, very possible. And sometimes you do have to force the issue for sure so that they enjoy the benefits of having that one-on-one connection. But I do think uh, he makes a point in that it is important to be tuned in to what the other individual's preferred method of communication is and to adapt um, as, as much as you can, for sure. Andre, what do you think? You've, you've heard a lot of these CJ stories, so you know that uh, sometimes he's from Mars and I'm from Jupiter. But what do, what do you think? What can we do better to <laughs> communicate with people like, like that, are, that are 10 years old and someday will be our clients? It's so true, though, that you've got to meet people where they're at. So CJ loves to communicate via text. There, that might be your preferred communication method with CJ. It's funny, I'm an in between you and, and CJ and I call my parents and if they don't answer my phone call and they respond with the text, I'm like, what the heck? Why didn't you guys answer me? So my preferred is a phone call. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've got to meet people where you're, they're at, but you know, there's also power in sending a written note, right? Because somebody says, wow, they really took the time to write this note to me and, and think about me in, in a different way. So just keeping all of that in mind is definitely important. But now I know I'm only going to text CJ. Nice. Only text the 10 year old, which is fine. I, I will stop putting notes in his lunch because I guess I get that that might be embarrassing. But I do have a rule in the car, which is no cell phones, no technology in the car. This I don't want to feel like a chauffeur or an Uber driver. He has to have a conversation with dad in the car. So that is that is one communication rule yeah. that, that I am going to stick to. Compromise. <laughs> Compromise. That's what it's all about. Carol. Thank you so much, Andre. As always, thank you for chatting. This has been such a great conversation. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our audience. Thanks for joining us today on another great episode of Perfectly Integrated. Hey, as always, I'm Matt Ackerman from Integrated Partners. Have a great day. Content in this material is for general information only and not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance referenced is historical and is no guarantee of future results. Securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advice offered through Integrated Partners, a registered investment advisor and separate entity from LPL Financial. The Integrated CPA Alliance is not affiliated with LPL Financial. 
Carol Anderson is president of MQ Research and Education and is a separate entity and not affiliated with Integrated Partners and LPL Financial.